Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to If Data Could Talk. My name is Andy Cotgreave. I'm technical evangelist at Tableau, and it is a pleasure to have you all with us. Today, we're talking about communication, specifically science communication, which has obviously been a very, very important role in the last 12 months around the world. And I'm delighted to be joined by Jessica Malati Rivera. Uh, she is a science communicator and infectious disease epidemiologist with over 15 years experience. And of those 15 years, the last year has been as science communications lead at the COVID tracking project. So Jessica, welcome to the show. Does that about summarize your life and experience? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Thanks Brilliant. for having me. Well, it's uh, really good to have you here with us today. And we're gonna be talking today about um, this field of science communication clearly been in the spotlight and you know in the audience you're probably communicating with data in some way quite regularly you probably lean towards being a scientist who knows maybe you don't maybe you do but uh we're going to really dig into what it's been like for jessica in the last 12 months and what we can learn as data communicators so let's get going science data science communication what what, what exactly is it can you just give us an overview of, of, of the role you've had at covid tracking project and you know try and give us a, a sense of your day-to-day -day life and the challenges. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you think about the scientific process, it involves a lot of data collection and testing and analysis, and then you've got results. And those results don't really serve much of a purpose if they sit in a lab behind closed doors or just on a paper that is only really legible by folks who kind of speak that language. So what science communication does is help translate that. It helps bring the audience and the viewership much broader, much wider much more diverse. And so essentially it's finishing the scientific process. It's taking it across that final step so that a broad group of people can understand it. And I think that's been especially uh, critical in a public health emergency with regard to COVID-19 because uh, for the first time in probably a long time, folks are now hearing things and reading things about everything from preprint studies and clinical trials and you know data readouts that if it doesn't have the kind of nuance required uh, to explain those things, either it can get lost in translation or just be completely misunderstood. Yeah, so I think uh, you've been described as something of an infodemiologist. Am I right? Is that uh, is that a new term from the last twelve months? Or it's not quite an official term, but infodemiology as a, as a subset of research is very real in the fact that you know if you, especially in my field of infectious disease. Uh, research and in emerging infectious diseases. That's what I have my master's degree in. Uh, when you detect and when you see outbreaks of new pathogens, it is almost expected that in tandem, you'll see an outbreak of information, misinformation, disinformation, and confusing um, uh, theories. And so uh, it very much requires a eye on both of those things. What is the actual virus doing? And what is the way people are talking about? What is that doing to things like public trust and public behavior? Uh, so infodemia is kind of a cheeky term to refer to people like me who track both. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think just that, that first thing you said, it just resonates so much because one of the things, you know, we, we always try and teach our customers, Tableau customers is, you know, it's great. You can invest in this, an engineering platform such as Tableau, you know, it, it collects, it analyzes, it stores your data. That's great. But if you don't do anything with that data, if you don't actually communicate it to persuade others and drive change, then the investment was possibly not worth it. Um, yeah. It's that last mile that's so important. Yeah, yeah. everywhere. Tableau's in my whole life. <laughs> it's, it's all over. So now, um, obviously, the last 12 months has been transformational in everybody's lives around the world. I mean, science communication existed. Uh, was it a case that the public, uh, you know, I guess they did, the public didn't really need to pay much attention to science in the past? Um, and is that is that highlighted problems in the field that you now like to see um, developed or has it been a really big opportunity uh, for science communicators like yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair thing to say that science has mostly existed behind closed doors unless there is something that has, you know, some sort of blockbuster implication on everybody or has some major financial implication on the stock market that you don't really hear about the minutia. You don't really hear about phase one, phase two data. You don't really hear about preprints because preprints, I mean, historically have been for folks in science who are looking for additional, uh, you know, similar research or topics that are of interest so that they can provide this kind of call and response feedback and help improve the process of research. Um, now it's 
you know, on public display in every corner of the internet, you're finding phase one, phase two, preprint, all the things in between. And I think scientists in the past have not specifically been trained to communicate their science beyond publishing them in formal papers that have a very specific audience. And so I think it's become more of a priority for folks in science, especially folks in public health, because it has implications for literally every single person, especially in a public health emergency. So what does it look like if you were to say to somebody who wanted to improve those communication skills and, you know, in science specifically, but applicable to others, what, what would be, you know, one or two or three things that you think would take them from being behind closed doors to really getting a message across to uh, the audience? Yeah, I feel very strongly that science communication is not dumbing things down. I think a lot of people look at that as how do I simplify this so that, you know, a lay person can understand it. Like that should be part of the goal. But I also think the primary goal should be thinking about your wider audience as an opportunity to teach them and elevate, right? So to increase science literacy, increase data literacy, instead of dumbing down the content that you already have, I think it's a huge opportunity to invite more people behind what has been historically closed doors in labs and universities and other research institutions. So that should, I think, be the motivation of like, how do we increase people's opportunity of understanding? Um, I also think that it's important to kind of pre-bunk. You anticipate ways in which this could be misunderstood, ways in which this could be manipulated so that you can kind of anticipate questions, anticipate bad takes and add as much nuance to whatever data visualization that you have or paper that you have, because what we've seen repeatedly happen in the pandemic is very bad takes on things that should be as simple, but our biases kind of don't make us uh, as discerning to see that. And then I think a third thing too would be to kind of know what's important to communicate and what's not. And I think that that means, you know, telling people if it's a scientific paper, for instance, you don't want people to just read an abstract and a conclusion. So many things get, you know, shoved into the methods and the results um, before conclusions and even limitations. So even just giving people a fluency in reading that um, is going to help with a lot of people's understanding and, and comprehension levels when this stuff becomes public. I love that. I love the answer, to, uh, particularly that idea of not dumbing things down. Now, but I guess, is it your job then to read the academic papers and try and apply those three lessons that you just thought of and then bring it to a public message? Or is it your job to help others do that or help the public understand how to read the papers to find those Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's kind of both, right? So I think science communicator as a role was not really a familiar title for many people. And when I got connected to the COVID tracking project, my goal was to like remind everybody that we're all science communicators, that all of our work to a degree is in the, in the effort of helping people have better understanding of epidemiological data, since we are all caring about it and we're all affected by it. So it's kind of like encouraging scientists, fellow researchers, fellow, fellow data specialists, how to kind of improve the ways in which we you know, publish our stuff. And it's also a reminder for me as an individual to know exactly what I should be doing. What's my motivation? What are my goals every time I write something or share something or post something? Um, pre-bunking is is a great term. I've not actually heard, heard heard that term before, but you know, obviously, the last twelve months has been there's been misinformation, but there's been misinterpretation, and there's, then there's been you know a public who you know as we say that 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 well, I'm going to use the word ignorant, but that's not in a negative way. We just we never had to deal with these concepts. So, yeah. can you talk about some of the biggest wins you felt maybe in the last twelve months, or some of the the hardest? challenges you've had to come uh, overcome with uh, some of the misinformation you know and some of some opportunities you found yeah so i guess some of the wins are i mean i think it's really remarkable that now people have the, this new lexicon that has been so niche for a long time people understand things like you know everything from what an epidemiologist does to why we why it's important to be testing people the importance of things like you know waiting a few weeks after vaccination for antibodies to build up um, you, you see kind of my, you know some breakthroughs in people's understanding of things that have previously been very siloed um, but I would say we kind of constantly see uh, logical fallacy traps that are so easily preventable but are just so easy to fall into um, by me, you know, sometimes seemingly uh, well-meaning people and well-meaning journalists and publications uh, who 
haven't done that kind of pre-bunking or extra diligence check to make sure that people read this and understand what it actually means. So for example, you know, dealing with the amount of COVID data that we dealt with from states and jurisdictions, we would see big numbers, tens of thousands of numbers of everything from tests to cases, sometimes deaths. And that wasn't always real-time data. It often wasn't. And I think probably the most real-time data we were managing was hospitalizations, like people who were currently in the hospital. And every now and then you'd get these kind of historical data dumps. And a lot of times it would be caveated by saying this was actually from X date or X window. And not everybody caught up on that, like, you know, caveat. And so you would just see these very erratic lines and spikes and dips in some people's charts when they would interpret the data into a visualization and without any context. So it would look like, oh my God, what is happening in X jurisdiction or what's been happening here where it seems like everything is fine. And I think that people fall into this if we just compare charts as they are presented to us because a chart, a chart has a sort of um, authority You know, Mm -hmm. you see it and you're like, somebody smart made that or somebody who knows how to handle numbers made that. But if you're not looking at what informs a chart, which are numbers, which requires a discerning mind to kind of see things like time series, um, it can really lead the public astray and cause them to make sometimes even policy decisions that are very flawed. uh, That's absolutely fascinating. There is there is a growing body of academic research supporting that people see charts as having an an inherent truthiness and authority um, and you know, people who want to go into the field of misinformation can uh, take advantage of that for sure. But, and, and another example there, I, I want to ask you about the challenge of um, trying to encourage people to dig in and get the full context compared with the fact that we live in a social media world which flies past us at 100 miles an hour. Now, I know in the UK, the Office of National Statistics, they've spent um, they've spent a lot of time in the last 12 months really rethinking how they create images that they embed in their publications because they know people just copy and paste images. And so now they've had to rethink what is in that image. They, they, they put more context in the image to avoid rather than embed the, you know, all the caveats uh, in the text of the web page itself. So I don't know, what, what's it been like for you trying to, you know, trying to be like, come on, everybody, pay proper <laughs> attention to these, you know, dig in yeah. while knowing that most of your audience are going to, you know, you know, look and move on. How, how do you balance that tension? Yeah. So it's, it's talking about the work that we do while doing the work that we're doing it. And, you know, as you know, COVID tracking project stopped collecting data on March 7th. The work has not ended. We're doing a lot of kind of post March 7th analysis and publication, but uh, you know, what we tried to do in that process of winding down was to just disclose all of our best practices and all and give as many warnings as we could to be like, these are things to avoid. These are ways in which you can kind of be led astray. It's kind of like, you know, being a parent and looking at your kid and saying, okay, now it's time to take your training wheels off. Like you can do this, right? And we were doing it Also because we were feeling increasingly more confident in the fact that this is federal data and it should be coming from the federal government. So we wanted to point people's gaze towards federal sources like the CDC and HHS. And we felt confident in that decision. We still do. I think we're still noticing though that there have been the occasional trips and falling off the bike from, you know, either individuals or even large newsrooms. And it sometimes takes speaking up and kind of reminding folks or doing, you know, a little bit of a Uh, debunking of sorts and say, actually, what's happening in X state is not this, it's more that. Um, And I think it's going to be a process of trial and error. uh, We have to also recognize the fact that we were saturated in this data night and day for Mm -hmm. 13 months. I mean, we didn't do anything but live and breathe this data. So we have an unusual uh, familiarity with the kind of quirks of COVID data, of public health data. And that's, that's not to say that nobody else does, but I do think that it's given us this kind of muscle memory of, okay, we know what to expect when this happens and we know how to respond to that. We know how to correct, course correct this. Um, so it's, it's very much a process, you know, it's not like very linear. Sometimes it takes, uh, you know, some mistakes and correcting the mistakes and sometimes yeah. it's waiting. Yeah. Um, just br- very briefly for anybody who is not familiar with the COVID tracking project, it was a, uh, a spread started as a spreadsheet run by the Atlantic journalists um, at the start of the COVID pandemic and a recognition that reliable data was not available. And it mushroomed to becoming a, hugely influential volunteer run project of which Jessica and many other great people were a part of 
and the API and the data sets were downloaded 14 million times or 14 million hits per day, just some crazy use. The data was used widely. Is that right? Um, it was. I think at the end of the day, there was somewhere in the billions of the amount of kind of downloads that we had and hits to our website. Yeah. I mean, it was it was remarkable. Yeah. So, it, and we have, we'll link, we had an episode where we, we talked in detail about the COVID tracking project uh, in the middle of last summer. We can link to that episode below um, and you'll probably see a link on the screen uh, or below wherever you're watching this. But um, yeah, as, as you mentioned that, Jessica, you, the, the, the data collection is now wrapped up and because the, the, ex, the you know, federal data sets are more robust, how, how are you reflecting on the process? It's obviously been a whirlwind year for the entire globe. How do you think, what's, what's the impact of the tracking project been and, and on you, your career or personally, um, you know, what, what's, what's your reflections? You know, I, I feel like the pandemic uh, was everything that I was training for as a professional. You know, I got my degree in emerging infectious diseases. I was working while I was in graduate school at Georgetown in the division of integrated biodefense, where we were tracking, trying to essentially do what we're doing now, which is track, predict, manage uh, growing emerging biological threats. And our team actually detected the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. So I have been kind of waiting for this to happen, right? This is um, not at all surprising to me. And so to be living it is also surreal, even though I expected it because uh, so much of how this has played out could have been prevented if the kind of work that I was doing and many others were doing had continued to be supported and funded by the federal government. I mean, there were so many ways in which this was a botched attempt at public health because we just didn't devalue, we had devalued all the ways that we were doing, all devalued all the things that we were doing to prepare for something like this. And, and, and as, you, as you sort of look forward uh, to, to, you know, to the future, uh, and as the, you know, so you see on Instagram, you, 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 your message is always, it will come to an end, get vaccinated and it will come to an end. You know, as what are the maybe two or three things you would just really want to continue uh, and become embedded as a result of what we went through uh, yeah. in the last 15 months? Yeah, I think it's really clear that, you know, we, many of us in this space knew that at some point a vaccine would have to be part of this equation, a part of our toolkit to respond to the pandemic. And as a science communicator who's worked on vaccine education and advocacy for a long time, I also knew that we were going to be facing a ton of resistance, vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaccine sentiments were going to be at the forefront. And so while I was very proud as a scientist to see kind of this huge financial backing of the vaccine manufacturing process, it also broke my heart very early on in the pandemic that as a country, we were not valuing science communication or even data communication because so many of the dr like dramatic headlines and you know misinformation campaigns and even conspiracy theories that really took a foothold on things like social media have required so much blood, sweat and tears to deplatform. And it's, it's, it's honestly a huge waste of many of resources. And the fact that we mm -hmm. have looked at science communication as an afterthought to science just shows that we have a lot of work to do. So looking forward, I would hope that those two things become more hand in hand, that when you have science, when you have research, when you have a public health emergency, we are prioritizing all the ways in which we can communicate about it because that's where trust can be built at the beginning. We don't, we can't, can, we can't afford to be, regaining trust and catching up and, and kind of doing damage control again, if this happens again soon. I mean, some of that is about also way back about the way we educate yeah. kids, right? And, you, you yeah. know, getting them to be much more literate in data and uh, science and, uh, and, and uh, things like that. I had another question. One of the ways, you know, we've talked a little bit about disinformation and social media, but one of the, your main conduits has been through Instagram. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, you see, so you really embraced that as a medium, how, how, how did, did that just organically happen? Or did you realize that was actually a good way to get messages across? It was not as strategic as you would think. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that, you know, Twitter can be kind of an echo chamber of sorts. And there's a lot of people saying a lot of the same things. Instagram didn't really have a lot of science content. Um, you know, I'm, I didn't come in as the first science communicator by any means, but I, a lot of my friends who knew the work and the expertise that I had, um, reached out to me and asked me very similar questions. They're like, what is, you know, herd immunity? What is, you know, SARS-CoV-2? So I just started doing very basic 
science 101s and my stories as a means to kind of like hit 20 birds with a stone because I get kept getting inundated with the same kinds of questions. And it turns out that there's a captive audience on Instagram for digestible, you know, very pithy summaries of uh, headlines of, you know, major milestones in the data. And I just started cross posting a lot of the stuff that I was seeing in my Twitter feed and even uh, my own research um, stuff from the COVID tracking project, just so that people were kind of, there were more eyes on it and it's turned into a whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's shown me that I like science education much more than I even thought I did. And that there, while it's a double-edged sword, it has many, many negatives to it. There's also been an incredible uh, amount of fruit that has been born from people digesting and and consuming information from Instagram about everything from vaccine safety and efficacy and data that would change and hopefully, you know, modify people's perception of their risks. It it is really cool to see uh, scientists become influencers of sorts. Like I will be Dr. Kuzmeki Corbett's biggest fan forever because of the role she played in mRNA vaccine development, specifically more than for the Moderna vaccine. And I have loved seeing her be on the spotlight. And I think that that mm-hmm. is, you know, it's about time to kind of uh, prioritize different kinds of influence in society. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, are you on TikTok yet? My ch- I'm sure my children would be like, Instagram dad, come on. <laughs> I know. I'm old. I, a TikTok <laughs> scares me. I, I am on it as a very, very casual consumer, but I have yet to be a sharer yeah. of content there. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I'm, I'm in this. I, well, I'm barely on Instagram. I still do things by hand. <laughs> I'm that old. Uh, so, yeah, brilliant. All right. Well, look, uh, now if people want to um, come and find, find out where you are, uh, connect with you, what should they do? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at Jessica Milati Rivera or on Twitter at Jessica Milati. I do have kind of different uh, streams of information because the types of people that follow me on both are very different, but I will be sharing all kinds of uh, science communication and data communication on both for the long foreseeable future. All right, brilliant. Yeah, so everybody go follow Jessica. Her accounts are great. Uh, Jessica, once again, thank you so much for all the work you've done uh, with the COVID tracking project and for being on the show. Hope you have a great day. You too. Thank you. Our pleasure. And again, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, Fascinating show. We hope. Let us know what you think in the comments. And we will see you next time on If Data Good Could Talk. Take care.